All right, so Yellow Jackets is all the buzz as episode three delivers even more questions, very few answers, and a human hangover that'll take you back to your college days. But welcome back to Heavy Spoilers, your home for, uh, well, 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 heavy spoilers. And in this video, we're going to be discussing everything in this latest episode, full on spoilers, callbacks, and weird theories we have. Give me a piece of that mint gum because I'm seeing double, baby. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, hitting that like button is much appreciated. And subscribe to RSVP to Shauna's baby shower of spoilers as we're covering this weekly. With that out of the way, thank you so much for clicking this. I'm your host, Jared. Now let's get into Yellow Jackets, Episode 3. So last week, Episode 2 ended with everyone but Coach Scott feasting on Jackie's loins, with us comparing it to the Greek tragedy of the Bacchae. And in that, with the main ad sobering up to realize the horrible acts they partook in, the Yellow Jackets are very much level-headed the next morning. Yeah, seeing uh, the picked clean carcass of Jackie they are responsible for. It's pretty f***ed up, and each girl has a different reaction to it. Some ranging from, eh, eh, it is what it is, and making jokes. I guess no one wants breakfast. Not the time, Mari. Je Jesus. While others are traumatized for life like Natalie here, but Thaisa's reaction is by far the scariest, with her not remembering any of it, supposedly being in her dream state other persona while it went down. Last week, we guessed that there was more to Thaisa than solely sleepwalking, and we get a bit more insight into this later, with a more aggressive side of Thaisa lying underneath. Luckily, Natalie steps in, suggesting they buried Jackie's bones with the others at the crash site, allowing her a proper burial. Now, Coach Scott did not partake in the Jackie buffet and is both passive-aggressive towards the girls and a little freaked out, hallucinating they are going to eat him, which we all know is just a matter of days away. Coach Scott pretty much dissociates from his current situation to memories of him and his writer boyfriend, Paul, before the crash. Hi, I'm Paul. In season one, he mentions that Paul wanted him to move in fully embrace his identity and relationship with Paul. But here we see how things truly play out with him being scared of what will happen after the move. How will it affect him, his family, career, the two's relationship, the fear of the unknown, or rather, the fear of letting his life be known, with Paul refuting in a far too ironic way. You always say those girls are vicious little monsters. He knew, Paul knew, yeah, that crazy son of a bitch, you knew. They are beyond happy together, but this is a huge bugaboo for Paul, and it's implied they break up. Later, though, we get to see the fork in the road, an entire what-if scenario of Coach Scott fully embracing Paul and the life that could have been. This really hit me in the feels because he gets to be who he truly wants to be and has his happy ending. But it's heartbreaking because this isn't reality. He tried to play it safe like most of us do, to be honest, and it turned out to be a complete train wreck or rather plane crash. Coach Scott has pretty much lost hope. He lost both things he thought he cared about in life, Paul and his safe career. And now where is he? Stranded in the wilderness, only having one leg with a bunch of teenage cannibals. Yeah, no thank you, and I have a feeling this hopelessness spiral will continue, leading to him willingly ending his life or surrendering to the greasy mitts of the girls. Coach Scott isn't going to see those spring flowers. The divide amongst Natalie and Lottie continues as Natalie heads off to the crash site, but not before denying Lottie of her Wicca bullshit once again. This loner persona she has later in present day looks to be further developing here, even rejecting the help of Travis with Jackie's remains. Natalie says a bit of a makeshift eulogy for Jackie's remains, showing a plethora of emotions. Natalie deeply regrets what happened to her, grateful because the others may now survive from her sacrifice, and expresses how lucky Jackie was. Even in her death, she was able to make the others jealous, there's going to be a huge ramp up of flesh eating in the coming months, and it is, it, it is not going to look good for anyone. Now this feels very Lost-esque with the smoke monster in that series, but Natalie is greeted by a majestic white moose. 
obviously having enough food to hold them over from eating Coach Scott mm, prematurely. Natalie takes a shot, misses far left, as the moose charges her and runs off. It's the first game Natalie has seen in weeks, but why does this appear out of nowhere like this? Well, I think it's because Natalie respectively returned Jackie's remains, therefore being a sign from the forest a good omen in a sense. Because moose or albino moose m- mice mice mooses moose moose carry several meanings, ranging from an animal of the spirit world, warding off evil spirits, guidance, working with the opposition, solidarity, and kindness. I see this as a sign from Jackie in the afterlife, thanking Natalie for being respectful of her even after the horrifying night before. This could be a pure spirit to otherwise ward off the evil spirits that we've seen taking play ever since season one. Also, it's said that killing a white moose will bring bad luck, so uh, it's kind of good that Natalie was a horrible shot. Present day, solidarity is something Natalie is slowly learning from Lottie and her followers, a bit standoffish, moseying around the grounds, which looks strangely familiar to the wilderness cabin with a lake nearby. When I Go Walking by Pope Coke plays here, and the music video for this looks like a blind believer being guided by another, which seems to be Natalie and Lottie's relationship at this point. Though Natalie has a tough exterior, she is slowly being molded by Lottie, even wearing a dash of purple later in the episode. The big Scooby-Doo mystery of this right here is Lottie's secluded cabin. Of course, we don't see what's hidden inside. Like, what is in there, man? It does sport a pair of antlers on the outside, though, symbolizing her time of the antler queen in the wilderness. Though it was never 100% revealed that it was her, this gives even more evidence that her teachings may be based on things that she learned back then in the wilderness. The bloodied moss again has a close-up of its own. Now back in episode 1, I mentioned that the moss in the wilderness on the weird mossy tree and around the cabin may symbolize some sort of supernatural darkness that is closing in on the group, and it has popped up in every episode since then, so uh, drop your moss theories in the comments below, hashtag mossgate. Now Lottie drops some of the most heavy-handed allusions to what the pair went through in the wilderness. In winter, they cluster around the queen and they vibrate to keep her warm. When a new queen hatches, the first thing she does is sting all the other unborn queens to death. I can see why you like them. It's simply what has to be done. Otherwise, they starve. We all do. Of course, praising the antler queen, them surviving the winter, whoever stood up against them was stung, quote stung here, aka made into their next meal to help feed the others. All of which sums up the pit girl in the ceremony from season one, episode one, again providing more evidence to Lottie being the antler queen and done so for the survival of the yellow jacket's hive. I have a bit of a theory about this that ties in with Jackie's necklace. You could argue Jackie was the original queen of the yellow jackets. I mean, she, she was the captain of the team after all. However, she was, quote, stung, therefore passed this designation on, with the necklace being the symbol of who the queen is, akin to that of the conch shell in the Lord of the Flies novel, which Yellow Jackets has more than a few similarities to. Currently, Shauna wears the necklace, so she is the queen currently, but maybe down the line, Shauna loses this honor if there are potentially complications with her baby, Therefore, again, passing it on. Because in the first episode, Pit Girl, whoever she is, is wearing the necklace. And my suspicion is that that is Mari. So how she receives it will be an interesting journey. Natalie experiences some more of Lottie's unorthodox teachings, urging Lisa to reach in and feel the anger and aggression she has towards Natalie. This flurry of emotions puts Lisa in the position of Natalie and understanding why she thrashed out at her, allowing for forgiveness to be the overwhelming emotion in the end. Again, I think this is showing Natalie that she can slowly trust and forgive Lottie for the things that may have happened in the wilderness 25 years ago and with what happened with Travis. That the pain of carrying resentment should instead be transformed into forgiveness. Lottie seems to have already gone through this transformation, so I'm curious if the forgiveness was towards her parents or others back in the wilderness or something else. 
Jeff and Shauna's marriage is very much on the rocks as we learned that one of the main reasons Shauna went forward, pursued the Adam Martin affair, was because her life and marriage is boring. Yes, I mean, we kind of knew that, but Jeff was the driving force of that boredom. Again, she grew into the life of Jackie and what she wanted. This, this isn't what Shauna wanted for her life. I mean, this is a lot of people, so everything is mundane. Shauna continues by saying the idea of not knowing what might happen was exciting to her. The idea of the unknown, which is very exciting to anyone. This right here is the concept Shauna has fully latched onto and honestly is loving it. While the Adam Martin situation led to excitement she hasn't experienced in, let's say, I don't know, 25 years since the wilderness. And now with Kevin keeping an eye on her, this again is something that is exciting. The man that steals their van is another exciting thing. And her using the tracking device from season one to track the van back is maybe the most exciting thing for Shauna. There is an evil, sinister side of Shauna that is desperately trying to break free of the Jackie mold and is loving this unclear path she's slowly strolling down. From the conversation with the chop shop owner, it sounds like Shauna actually enjoys killing. Adam knocked something loose that had been dormant for the last 25 years. Sure, we know in the wilderness things got hairy real quickly, but Shauna may be the one responsible for a lot of the deaths back then. Essentially, when talking about the look in their eyes. There's a look people get when they realize they're going to die. It's that one. Shauna has a hunger, <laughs> pun, pun intended, and no doubt Adam Martin is not going to be the last one. Because with the altercation between Kevin and Jeff at the gym, and Kevin knowing more than anyone else about the Adam Martin case, I could see Shauna eliminated Kevin and then pinning it on Jeff down the road. This gym incident shows potential motive, and Shauna would be free of the boring prison she finds herself in. Thaisa is dealing with the ramifications of the car accident from last week, and yeah, our suspicions that there are two ties at work is pretty much 100% confirmed with her talking to a reflection in present day, and the other being in control of the sleepwalking bouts back in the wilderness. Now, the interesting thing is that this other tie seems to only have control when Thaisa is sleeping, dealing with overwhelming amounts of stress, basically when she's not at 100%. But also that this persona knows about the man with no eyes, who I'm still saying is some sort of harbinger of doom, leading her straight to the symbol carved into the tree. Now, the weird thing is that the sleepwalking tie also seems to know about the signs, but the conscience Thaisa doesn't. This is shown in the wilderness when she regains consciousness with Van and seems to be wary of when she finds the ritualistic altar in her basement and the symbol drawn on Simone's hand. The symbol is a warning sign, maybe even a ritualistic marking, but nothing is 100% clear with that yet. Either way, it's not something Thaisa is thrilled about. Back in season one when Lottie is possessed, something says you must spill blood or else. Now, Thaisa was the one who wrote spill in red paint on their front door, and having this symbol pop up after sacrificing Biscuit and purposely spilling the blood of Simone, I believe that the other persona knows much more than we're led to believe right now. When Thaisa confronts the other half in the mirror, one thing that she mouths is go to her, or at least this is what I think, moving her hands across her face like a mask. This is no doubt the other half trying to tell Thaisa to go to Van because the hands on the face look like that of Van's mask she wore after the wolf attack in season one. This also ties in with Thaisa trying to call Jessica, the investigative reporter from season one. She's calling Jessica to help track down and find Van in present day so she can ask her what the other half may want. The man with no eyes or even the symbol. We know from this new intro in season 2 that adult Van is out there still alive, so I think we're going to learn much more about Thaisa from her. The FBI informant that Misty and Walter interrogate is, of course, Randy. I completely forgot he was also staying at the motel, so everyone who commented it last week, you've done it, you've solved the case. But the funny thing is, Randy thinks that this is about blackmailing and Adam Martin, while Misty thinks that this is something to do with Natalie. It's the worst case of uh, who's on first, to be honest, but luckily they get a lead on Lottie's purple goon squad that they're hanging around drinking all of the Fanta. 
a couple weeks ago, we talked about Lottie wearing orange and the purple followers being like heliotrope flowers following the sun. So it only makes sense that they would drink all of the Fanta because orange is the most popular flavor. Again, they are attracted to the sun. But the main thing to pull from this is that Misty and Walter are one in the same, dressed in a similar clothing, both detective citizens, eccentric, possibly borderline OCD, and great at keeping secrets, or rather, acting in Misty's case. Because after the interrogation, Walter reveals his hand about wanting to actually meet the infamous African Grey and coming clean about the woman not being his mother. However, Misty sticks to her guns and lies about Adam Martin. All right, then. Keep your secrets. Good. Now, one thing I do see happening between the pair is a budding friendship or potential relationship. There are a few reasons for this, obviously, that they are very similar, but Walter's boat is named Great Expectations, which may be referring to the Charles Dickens novel by the same name. The novel follows an orphan who seeks for a greater lot in life until a twist of fate and the evil machinations of the mysterious and eccentric Ms. Havensham shows him a dark world of possibilities. Walter may or may not have a family, revealing that, again, the person he was wheeling around was just a friend, and Misty has a dark, murderous side to her, so she may manipulate his otherwise innocent spirit as things move on, because they are definitely a road trip into find Lottie's gang next week. But the way Misty reacts to Walter and his text later tells me that she is both ecstatic and cautious of this new friendship. Now my guess is that she's still broken from whatever happened to Crystal in the wilderness. We see the two that they are becoming great fast friends, but there is no trace of her in present day. Meaning Misty either ate her, killed her, manipulated, or threw Crystal under the bus to survive. This is why this Walter connection may mean a whole lot more to Misty than we currently know. Another reason we can assume Crystal's memory still lives on with Misty is because of her affinity for musicals. Back in season one, she mentions Cats and listens to Phantom of the Opera, both of which tie back to Crystal's love for the theater, musicals, and acting. Misty mentions the awe of someone becoming someone else, while Crystal mentions we're all made of lies. Misty is the prime example of both of these in present day, again with Crystal having made a big impression on her. Another way to look at it could be this wild out there theory, but one of our editors suggested that Crystal is actually Misty's imaginary friend. What a twist! I kind of believe it, and there is evidence with them sharing a love for musicals and would make the Walter friendship even more impactful. We've seen Crystal interact with the other girls, but it could all add to the unreliable narrator point of views of things. The main thing happening back in the wilderness is the makeshift baby shower the girls throw for Shauna and her baby boy, or at least that's what Lottie says, potentially seeing a future vision once again. It's your everyday average baby shower aside from a couple of things. First is Mari making a weird potentially ritualistic dream catcher mobile to hang above the baby crib, but also her randomly asking about a dripping noise. Okay, there it is again. You guys really don't hear dripping? Now, I watched this a couple of times and I couldn't hear anything, so obviously it's in Mari's mind. But as for what it could be, I'm saying some sort of blood dripping potentially tying in with the dripping of Jackie's fingers and bones to open up this episode, or alluding to the blood that dripped on the blanket later. Lottie gifts Shauna with a blanket that has the mysterious symbol sewn into it, this causes the two sides to once again fracture, but Shauna's bloodied nose drips on the symbol, resulting in a flock of birds to randomly die falling on the cabin. The reason for this is unknown, but back in season one, during the seance night, Lottie says you must spill blood or else. With the blood dripping on the symbol, it appears whatever supernatural forces are happy with this, and therefore they receive an offering in exchange. This could even be the meaning of the bare heart sacrifice by Lottie, which I have a feeling actually hasn't happened yet. It's something that happens in the future, maybe later in the winter or even the second winter, but we even get a look at the smashed window pane in the attic, of which we tied into Lottie's third eye being opened, allowing for the visions. 
Tori Amos's bells for her begins to play as the girls sort of separate into their dueling factions. This song's meaning is talking about the end of a friendship, which I think is alluding to Van and Thaisa. They have already been on the rocks with Van mentioning Lottie so much, so I think that this is the beginning of the end for the two, giving them even more reason for present-day Thaisa wanting to track down Van. The episode closes with Lottie's visions intensifying, showing all of the bees dead and blood-soaked honeycomb. A terrible, <laughs> terrible metaphor for Winnie the Pooh blood and honey, but rather this is a symbol for how the bees mirror the yellow jackets in the wilderness. Bees tend to live on the bare minimum so that they can all survive, much like the winter setting. But when the bare minimum isn't enough, the queen had to go in and kill the others for the good of the entire hive. Much like I theorized about the necklace, the queen was in charge of picking who was the next meal. And with Lottie, literally having blood on her hands makes me believe that she was also responsible for a lot of the bloodshed in the wilderness. Lottie hears more French. Il vous de sang. I think they say il vous du sant, which means good for you, hinting at what she did was good for her and the others. Either way, something is causing Lottie's visions to intensify, which we're bound to find out soon. Before we wrap up, I have a crazy, wild out there theory pulling from a lot of things, but I think the entire wilderness supernatural elements can be explained away because they are above a giant underground mining operation. What? <laughs> yeah, follow me here. Beneath them are abandoned mines, maybe even containing hot springs, and this is where Javi has been hiding. The heat also explains why the weird mossy tree seems to be melted around the base and has moss growing on it. The symbols are warning signs of hazardous chemicals like mercury in the runoff. Maybe even iron because of the red water from season one. The iron also could explain why the compass didn't work and why the bird seemingly lost flight and fell to the ground. The hallucinations too come from the runoff. Potentially everyone has mercury poisoning and everything is a warning. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Obviously, they are cooking a lot so far. So many questions, but I'm really digging this episode in this season two and where they're trying to take things, really weaving it all together with the underlying mystery elements being the best part. Anyway, that is episode three of season two. The showrunners have a lot cooking right now. They're cooking, baby, at this point, but I'd love to hear your theories. And of course, let us know if we missed anything in the comments below. The necklace theory, maybe it's out there. It's crazy out there, but there might be something to it. And I'll let you know, we're currently running a competition, giving away three copies of the Superman collection on the 15th of April. And all you gotta do to get a chance of winning this baby, listen up, is like this video, subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts of Yellow Jackets Episode 3. We pick the comments at random at the end of every single month, and the winners of last month are on screen right now. So if that's you, message us on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, be sure to check out some of our cool videos over there. Bunch of old breakdowns, Mario, Super Mario Bros, tons of stuff. But with all of that out of the way, seriously, thank you. Thank you so much for always watching, support, everything. I've been Jared. I'll see you in the next one. Take care and peace.